Today we're very fortunate to have two speakers who will who have long-term expertise in the region of West Africa, and they also have insight into the Ebola virus that is uh, the epidemic that is uh, spreading throughout the region. Um, we have Matthew Lawrence. He's an assistant professor at the medical school at the University of Maryland. He will be speaking first. Uh, Dr. Lawrence is an infectious disease specialist. He uh, has mainly worked with malaria and anti-malarial immunity, but he has done a number of studies in not only in the U.S., but in West Africa. Also, in fact, he was in the Peace Corps in West Africa um, many years ago. Many years ago. And we also have Akunle Awalabi, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Villanova University. Uh, Dr. Awalabi is, you know, teaches uh, graduate and undergraduate courses on the politics of West Africa, the politics of development. Uh, he focuses on a number of different developing areas, but he also has a special a special focus on West African countries. Um, so they are each going to speak, and please save your questions for after. We'll have plenty of time for you to pose some questions. Okay, I'll turn it over to our speakers. All right, good afternoon. Thanks very much for the opportunity to come and, and address you all today, and I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. So I'll be talking about mostly uh, the background medical information for Ebola virus and cur current uh, trends. Just to show you the outline of the talk will be to describe the virus, and then I'll talk briefly about the epidemiology of Ebola, the pathogenesis, the clinical manifestations, what do people have as far as symptoms and signs go when they get the disease, the current treatment options or lack of treatment options is uh, a better description, um, and then prevention. So Ebola is a virus. It's an enveloped virus. It takes the host cell and it takes it makes itself a membrane out of that and then it's the Ebola lipoprotein -like on the surface. It comes from the family phyloviridae, meaning phylum for thread, and it's of the genus Ebola virus. So there are five different species of Ebola virus, and each of those species there are subspecies or different types that differ genetically. But of the five species, there's Zaire or EBOV, and that's causing the current outbreak in West Africa. There's Sudan, there's Ivory Coast or Thai Forest, there's Bunyu, named for a region in Uganda. There's also Reston, and this is considered a VSL4, a bio, bio threat category A virus, so highly infectious and high lethality, so it's of the highest concern. So epidemiology was first recognized in Zaire, um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, as it's now called, also in Sudan, and this was in 1976. So quite a while back, almost 40 years, it has caused multiple outbreaks in Africa since then, and I'll show you a map of where those outbreaks have occurred. Um, it's also called what are known as epizootics, or outbreaks in animal populations, in addition to human populations, with high mortality in chimps and gorillas. The current outbreak in West Africa is by far the very largest ever recorded in history. Um, and it's also unique in that it is the first urban epidemic. Most epidemics that have occurred have been in isolated, sort of remote villages. But this is the first urban epidemic, and um, truly that, that's probably why we're seeing the high numbers that we have now. So a bit about the epidemiology. So this shows a map of Africa. So let's see. Pointer. So, depending on the country, the, the number of Ebola outbreaks that have occurred in the past, that's what I'm showing you here. So DRC is this very large country in the central part of Africa that has experienced six outbreaks. Uganda, this tiny country just to the right of DRC, uh, five outbreaks. Gabon on the west coast, four outbreaks in the past. South Sudan, just above Uganda and DRC. Um, Republic of Congo, this tiny sliver of a country here. Um, and Ivory Coast, there's been one outbreak back here on the, the west coast of Africa, and then the current outbreaks um, that are occurring in uh, the three countries of West Africa, I'll show you in, in detail. Also, one outbreak has been described in South Africa. So as you can see, most outbreaks to date have occurred in Central Africa, so this is also unique in that um, it, it's a very large outbreak, and it's also happening in West Africa that is seeing much less Ebola than 
So the first case in the current outbreak was, was described in December of last year in Eastern Guinea. It was confirmed by the World Health Organization in March of this year. And as of September 30th, the total number of cases has reached over 7,000 with over uh, 3,000 deaths. And these are the actual official numbers of persons who were diagnosed the real number of cases on the ground and the number of mortality is easily double that. Um, it's really hard to say because accurate diagnosis is lacking. And uh, these are just uh, estimates based on known cases. So the unknown cases, the cases that occur, deaths that are buried, and thought to be related to other causes, we'll probably never know about. There have been cases related to this outbreak in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and Senegal. The genetic sequences that has investigated the cases to date show sustained person-to-person -person transmission. So people aren't getting virus from different sources. This is a common source virus. It's all the same strain. It's all related, and it's um, now being spread mostly person-to-person. -person. So there's a separate outbreak ongoing that you might have heard about, and that's back in the DRC in the Democratic Republic of Congo. That also started this year in August. It's not epidemiologically related. That's a different strain. That's, that's not related to what's happening in West Africa. And this came from a woman who was preparing bush meat. Um, it's linked to 62 cases and 35 deaths. It's also Ebola Zaire, but it's a different strain of that virus. So the current outbreak in West Africa, we said is happening in three countries. So Sierra Leone, here SL on the west coast of Africa, in Liberia, the yellow country here, and in Guinea, in the red country just above. Um, the spread is thought to have started in Guinea, in this region, this is what this map is showing here, and then spread to other urban areas close by in uh, neighboring Sierra Leone and Liberia. The green on the map shows where potential cases have been tested um, there was one in Nigeria that uh, actually tested positive from the outbreak. Um, and the bottom left shows the number of cases and the case fatalities as well. So the red is the case, the number of deaths, and the blue is the number of cases. And this is, again, the number of cases that we know about that are reported. Many others are occurring that we probably don't know about. Close-up view of the areas that are affected, so Sierra Leone in the middle, and then Liberia, again, on the coast here, and then getting the sliver of the country above. So Ebola, where does it come from? How does it transmit from nature to humans? So monkeys are not reservoirs. Um, what we know about Ebola now suggests that bats are the culprits, bats that inhabit deep in, in caves. And we know this from experience with a, a related virus called Marburg virus. The Marburg virus has been isolated in bats in caves in Uganda, um, and Ebola itself has been isolated in little collared and hammerhead fruit bats in caves. So it's they found it in bats. It doesn't affect bats the way that it does humans or other animals. Bats merely carry it, and they're not affected by disease, but they can transmit it to other animals and other humans when they come into contact. So there's great genetic diversity in this virus in bats. Um, it's long been present in the species, and some matched vi virus sequences from the bats have related to matched virus sequence in miners who've gone deep inside of caves and actually had Ebola. So we know that there is transmission occurring from bats. How is it transmitted? And this might help to explain some of the, the current dilemmas we're having controlling and containing the virus. So in laboratory animals, we know that lab animals can get it by ingestion, they can get it by in inhalation, they can get it by skin breaks, injection, droplets into the eyes, and droplets into the mouth. How does it happen person to person? Well, it requires direct contact with body fluids. You have to have body fluid contact. Just being in the same room with that person is not going to give you Ebola. You have to contact somehow with the uh, body fluids. So in West Africa, this is important because there are many rituals around funerals and around deaths and burials, and I'll show you a few pictures to try and uh, explain that, but there is a lot of ritual washing of bodies after the person has died, and a lot of concern about leaving that body alone before burial. Someone is usually with bodies in general in West Africa for long periods of time. Obviously, there are regional differences and variations, but there is a lot of handling of the body after death. And 
that can definitely put you in contact with body fluids. And if that person died of Ebola, the person's handling that body could easily get sick themselves and transmit to others. Healthcare workers also experience exposures due to lack of personal protective equipment. So if they're lacking the necessary gloves and suits and other uh, pieces of equipment re required to prevent uh, spread, then they're susceptible also. Animals can transmit it to persons as well through infected bush meat. So if an animal has been infected by a bat and then the person, such as the woman in DRC, uh, cooked the bush meat and she prepared the bush meat before she cooked it, then she was in contact with that animal secretion and by that she was infected. So I just discussed a bit about traditional burial rituals and burials are a big deal in West Africa and just from my time as a Peace Corps volunteer where I was, the whole village and then a few other villages come and they go to the funeral. And it's not just a simple one hour affair, it's days and days and days. And it's not just during the day, it's at night. And you're, you're, you bring your mat and you sleep outside of the building where the person died. And the people are inside washing the body and massaging the hands and preventing rigor mortis. And they're the same people that come outside and greet the people who come to visit the dead and the family. So you can see how transmission might occur um, in this setting. However, it's very important and it's very vital to the culture in West Africa. They, they have very deep uh, uh, roots in their uh, rituals around uh, burials, and um, this has caused a lot of, of conflict. So the traditional burial, this is in Nigeria. Um, the body uh, is sort of placed into the ground in sort of a peaceful setting. In some areas of West Africa, the body is actually buried inside the home, in the living room floor, where the dirt floor might just be all that's between uh, yourself and your relative. Um, however, with the advent of Ebola, now we have people dying in their homes and we don't have this peaceful, large community gathering to celebrate a death. We have men coming in these crazy white suits with goggles on and all kinds of respirator equipment, spraying left and right, putting your loved one in a sack, basically, and carrying them off um, in a truck. So this has uh, created a lot of challenges as far as how to contain and control the virus and how to develop a culturally sensitive approach uh, to help combat this um, epidemic. So there's a burial team in Liberia. Um, they've got uh, a sack just there in the back of the truck that they've just collected. And then there are certain uh, acceptable burial sites where uh, persons who have died with Ebola or suspected Ebola are, uh, are buried. <coughs> So a bit more about the Ebola virus ecology. Um, there is, there are two cycles that I'll just mention briefly, and one is called the enzootic cycle, and that's where bats are carrying the virus, and they uh, give offspring to other bats, and other bats therefore carry the virus as well. And it's when bats come into contact with animals or uh, or even humans, but uh, definitely when they come into contact with animals and persons living in close proximity to those animals might come in contact with them, whether they're hunting them for meat or uh, just as a result of their daily activities, um, then they might be exposed. So Ebola basically infects the uh, immune system. It infects uh, epithelial cells in one particular part that I'll explain that, that might help you understand the hemorrhagic nature of Ebola. Why does it make people bleed? Why do we see people bleeding out of their noses and into their skin? It affects what are called um, the, the endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels. And it's those endothelial cells, when they are affected by the virus, they simply lose their function. And so those tight junctions that occur inside of your blood vessels in the endothelium and endothelial layers, when they are gone and they're compromised, then the blood just leaks everywhere. Not only inside your tissues in your body, but on the outside as well. So that's sort of the, the hemorrhagic nature of the virus. Um, I'll skip some of those technical medical terms. Um, but basically, there, there's an abrupt onset of the virus after a brief incubation period. That incubation typically lasts 8 to 10 days, and it's been about 11 days to date in the, the documentation from the World Health Organization. There's no evidence that incubating people are contagious. So in that first eight to 10 days, there's no evidence that blood or body secretions are contagious to others. Um, in general, it causes fever, chills, malaise, weakness, vomiting, headache, and muscle pain. Sounds like the flu. Um, and it, uh, it appears like the flu. 
And then the rash appears on day five to day seven. So the rash is something that you might see on the top right here, and this is sort of the hemorrhagic rash. So that capillary leak syndrome, where the endothelial vessels just sort of lose their function, blood is just going anywhere it wants to go inside your, your, your body tissues. That's how it's identified, and you can imagine if someone died of Ebola and their body were being washed, then that might make their blood more accessible to the people washing them, and they, they, they might come into contact. So other manifestations, it causes diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. We talked about bleeding from uh, many different areas. So what happens when you get it? So you have that, that incubation period, and then you get disease. So disease is caused by the virus. It, it's related to having very low blood pressure, not having enough uh, fluid in your circulatory system, and that definitely causes end organ failure and potentially death. So case fatality is estimated at about 60%. Um, survivors, if they do survive, will improve about a week into the virus. But if they don't, then they'll actually die at, at around the same time. Um, and you can see skin sloughing and hair loss and fatigue among survivors. So it's important for diagnostic purposes to get an accurate travel history of anyone coming through uh, who's been to areas where Ebola is transmitted promptly isolate them, you can test them for viral antigens or RNA, and those are the definitive tests that are used for testing. Um, just to show you the difference, so there's an isolation unit in London in a high secure unit hospital on the top. There are holes where you put your arms in to touch the patient. This is actually a patient bed um, and a contained respiratory unit to filter out anything at all that the, the healthcare worker might come into contact with. And on the bottom, there's an isolation unit in a developing country with a wide open window next to the bed up here. So very, very different resources in um, developing countries uh, versus the West. And here's an Ebola treatment ward in Conakry, Guinea. This was set up by Vincent Saint Frontier in um, Conakry to help uh, isolate persons who were suspects or ill. So Ebola treatment, how do we treat it? The mainstay of treatment is supportive care. So there, as you'll see, we don't really have a lot of good uh, antiviral medications or medicines to treat it. We just give supportive care. So we give fluids, replace the fluid loss in the intravascular space. We uh, do blood transfusions as well, but those are the mainstays. It sounds pretty simple, but in a very fractured healthcare system in a developing country, that's very extremely taxing. Um, infection control is also important, where you isolate cases and suspected cases, and you also need to protect your healthcare workers. They need to have their personal protective equipment. So that's how it's treated. There was a WHO ethics panel on Ebola about two months ago. They approved the use of experimental agents just because of the high lethality of the virus. It's so illegal. They approved uh, this use. Um, the existing supplies are very limited or even exhausted. Um, but they can't detract from the basic tenets of care, which would be supportive care, uh, giving IV fluids and blood transfusions, and using rigorous infection control, contact tracing and follow-up, um, and social mobilization. So how is it treated? So we've heard about some treatments in the media, and the most common that I've heard myself is called ZMAP, and ZMAP is a monoclonal antibody product. And it basically gives persons antibodies who didn't experience Ebola in the past and helps them, uh, in theory, to fight off the virus. So there are three humanized mouse monoclonal antibodies. It's actually manufactured in tobacco plants. It's grown in tobacco. Um, we could have a few hundred doses by the end of 2014, but the current supply is exhausted. There is no more ZMAP currently. There, there is an effort to get more in production now. And we know that studies in monkeys and rhesus macaques that received the ZMAP product and then were challenged with Ebola virus in a very controlled experimental setting, all 18 of them survived. Um, so that, that's where it showed promise, and this was also used in uh, victims uh, both in West Africa and in the US. Another is called TKM Ebola, and that interferes with RNA expression. And that is an experimental drug that's also being used in West Africa. Blood transfusions from survivors might have potential because they would give antibodies to persons who have not seen the virus before. If you had the virus and you recovered, then presumably your immune system kicked in and you do have an antibody response. So it's the antibodies that you would transfuse to the person who's sick and help them to make it uh, to the finish line and fight the virus. 
hyperimmunoglobulin is sort of the same principle, but it's where you would take someone's blood and then take out only the antibodies and then transfuse those. So Ebola vaccines, this is um, sort of very new and on the frontier. We've had just recently started a, an Ebola vaccine trial at University of Maryland, as well as at Oxford um, in the UK and the BRC at the National Institutes of Health in DC. Emory University is also participating, but there is a, what's called a CHAD3 virus um, vector. So it's, uh, I can go into details, but basically it's an experimental Ebola vaccine um, that's being tested currently. It's also shown promise in animal models and rhesus macaques. And uh, if, it's prompt, if it actually works, then 15 doses could potentially be available by the end of this year. So, 15, sorry, 15,000, yeah, um, which, is, which would be huge. And this could be prioritized for healthcare workers and people who are at high risk and, and uh, might come in contact with the virus. So in Baltimore, we're enrolling uh, currently, and in Bamako and Mali, this is also being done, and in Gambia as well. This, there, there are many sites that are conducting this vaccine trial. And there's a plan to possibly deploy and study on healthcare workers. So that's all I have for now. Okay, thanks, and I'll pass to the next speaker. Okay, um, thank you everybody. My name is Kumle Olavi, and I uh, teach political science at Villanova University. So I'm going to be uh, continuing on uh, from where Matthew left off, um, but focusing a little bit more on some of the um, political and developmental uh, dimensions of uh, the current outbreak. I'm going to try not to, there is some duplication in the slides, but I'll try not to uh, duplicate too much so that we can talk about a few different things. So, um, I wanted to start off with a map of uh, West Africa again, um, because one of the things that I'd like to do today is highlight um, a lot of the cross-national uh, variation across the different countries in West Africa. So the three countries that you see highlighted in red um, on the left side of your map, um, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, um, are the most uh, affected countries. The only other country that's had uh, Ebola deaths in West Africa is Nigeria, um, but there have been far fewer deaths there um, than in other places, and I'm going to talk uh, about why uh, that is the case in my presentation. One of the things, again, I want to highlight is how um, the outbreak kind of transpired and spread over time. Um, as Matthew mentioned, the first uh, case uh, that was recorded uh, was in Guinea back in December of last year, but it wasn't actually recognized as such until uh, the spring of this year. And you can see that as of the beginning of July of this year, the country with the mo most deaths uh, by far was Guinea. And you can see that as of July 1st, uh, there were only a handful of deaths uh, in Liberia and Sierra Leone. So just watch how things change over time, keeping in mind that this is a very short time span. This is only three months. So as of last week, right, um, the most heavily affected areas are sort of, is that northwest corner um, of Liberia that also borders Sierra Leone and Guinea, um, and the surrounding areas of Monrovia, which is the capital city of Liberia, have also been very badly hit. And that sort of speaks to the urban uh, dimension of this current outbreak, which, um, as we've heard already, makes it really different from some of the earlier uh, outbreaks. Um, also in Nigeria, um, the only uh, recorded cases have been in and near big cities. Um, Lagos, which is the largest city in Nigeria, it's got about 20 million people located there. And Port Harcourt, which is down in this part of the country, in the Niger Delta, and that's um, around where the uh, oil industry in Nigeria is is based. Um, you can see now the death toll um, 
has skyrocketed um, compared to the levels at the beginning of July. And as we heard earlier, um, the number of actual deaths is probably more than double that. It's just really hard to um, properly uh, diagnose in places where the public health uh, situation is as insufficient as it is in many of these countries. And you can see now that the, by far the worst affected country is Liberia. Um, even though the outbreak did start um, in Guinea, and as recently as July, it was Guinea that was the most heavily affected country. Um, keep in mind when you look at that, um, the population of Liberia is less than 10 million. Um, the population of Nigeria, by contrast, is about 150 million, probably more. Um, so as a percentage of the population relative to the size of the country, um, Liberia has been very badly affected um, by this outbreak. Also, we heard already um, some of the ways in which this is different from uh, previous outbreaks of Ebola that have happened mostly in uh, rural parts of Central Africa. Um, this is by far the deadliest outbreak though. So there have been more deaths um, in this year than in all of the previous outbreaks combined going back to uh, 1976. So we're gonna talk about some of the reasons why uh, the spread has been so uh, rapid. Um, so West Africa as a region is much more heavily urbanized and densely populated um, than Central Africa. Um, and there have been outbreaks in rural areas as well, which have been very uh, difficult to access. So sort of that northwestern corner of Liberia that borders uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea is a pretty rural uh, area. Um, but the, the capital cities of uh, a number of countries have been badly affected, particularly Monrovia. Um, and these are cities that all have uh, international airports with direct flights all over West Africa um, to Western Europe, to the United States every week. And this um, creates a lot more potential for rapid uh, transmission than when you have outbreaks in very remote, uh, heavily forested areas in, in a large uh, you know, relatively remote place like Gabon or the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now having said that, this is still one of the poorest regions um, in the world where the uh, resources and the public health infrastructure, infrastructure are definitely in, insufficient um, for handling an outbreak of this magnitude. Um, another issue that I really want to highlight here um, is the issues related to government and governance. And I'll show a little bit of data on this uh, later. Um, but the quality of government in general in, in West Africa is pretty low. Um, although many of the countries that have been badly affected by the US Sierra Leone are much better and more effectively governed today than they were 20 or 30 years ago. This is the irony that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. Um, but one of the things, one of the legacies of decades of mismanagement in that government is that there's a lot of mistrust um, of public officials and the uh, capacity of the state itself to deal effectively um, with crises is pretty low. Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone both had uh, devastating uh, civil wars. Um, Liberia starting in the beginning of the 1990s, Sierra Leone a little bit later. Um, and those two countries have really only uh, restabilized again in the past 10 years or so. But one of the consequences of this is that um, a lot of infrastructure that had been developed up until 1960 or 1970 um, has deteriorated seriously over time. There's problems with drain, drain, drain. There are problems with um, medical staff and other professionals uh, ha having been forced to flee the country already. So those years of, of mismanagement and bad governance that really were between the 1970s and about 2000 um, have really incapacitated uh, particularly uh, Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone in terms of their ability to deal with uh, the crisis now. Um, 
The international response has also been pretty slow. Um, as we've heard already, the first uh, case was last December. It wasn't recognized as such until um, March. Um, the international community really didn't get going on this uh, until uh, the end of July. And in, in terms of the early efforts, uh, there was not a whole lot of correlation between uh, Doctors Without Borders, MSF, and the different, the national health ministries of the different countries um, in West Africa. And the WHO didn't really do much, nor did the U.S. government, um, until uh, two American health workers got sick um, in July. Now there's been a more vigorous response uh, from the U.S. Other Western countries have been a bit slower uh, still uh, to respond. So uh, you, you can see from the, the graph um, that's up there now um, just how the extent to which both the number of cases and deaths have skyrocketed since July, whereas if there had been a more robust uh, intervention earlier in the spring, we might have been able to um, avoid some of what we've seen in the last three months. Um, as I mentioned already, Liberia is now by far the worst affected uh, country. Um, and one of the areas that has been worst hit is this region called, uh, district called Monserrado County, uh, which is around uh, where, just outside of where the, the national capital, Monrovia, is uh, located. Um, there are not enough hospital beds. Um, there are not enough health workers. Many, many health workers have died. Um, there are very high levels of mistrust um, of government officials in general. Um, and the government and the military and the police have not been able to uh, enforce uh, quarantines uh, effectively. Um, there was a case uh, about a month ago where um, an isolation unit was broken into and the patients were taken out and removed from that. And I'll show you some, some pictures just to sort of, sort of highlight the extent uh, of the confrontation between the government and the society. We heard a little bit about um, burial practices already and how this helps to spread um, the disease, so I won't uh, go over that again. Um, so this is an area called West Point, um, which is a peninsula um, just outside of uh, Monrovia, which is the capital city of Liberia. And you can see from looking at that, it's a very poor um, area. There's only one road in and out that connects the peninsula with the, the capital city. Um, and the police and military have tried to block that off uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and you can see uh, the military presence um, trying to uh, guard, uh, prevent people from coming and going uh, in West Point. Of course, the people who live there are very frustrated by this because it affects everyone alike, regardless of whether you have symptoms or not. And if you can imagine the people who live there who are trying to work and make a living, um, they can't go about with their livelihood. And uh, you can see from the, the images here um, all the frustration between uh, residents and uh, the uh, military, and it's been pretty violent um, at times. Um, Nigeria, on the other hand, has been relatively, considerably more successful in terms of curbing what could have been an absolutely devastating uh, outbreak. And, uh, um, we don't know what's going to transpire in the future, so uh, I'm not suggesting that Nigeria is completely out of the woodworks. Um, but uh, Ebola spread to Nigeria at the end of July when a Liberian-American diplomat who had been sick and in the hospital in Monrovia left hospital against his doctor's uh, orders, traveled to Nigeria to attend a conference. Um, arrived in Nigeria, I believe, on the 21st of July, and then died in the hospital in the last four days uh, later. 
Now, the response of the government was very rapid and, and vigorous. Um, the patient arriving on the plane uh, was screened, tested, isolated, all in the airport, taken straight to the hospital. Um, then they managed to contact uh, all the other passengers who had been on the plane, everyone who may have come in contact with that person um, in the airport, and in total almost 900 people were contacted, identified, screened, uh, isolated. Um, and then the government basically um, mobilized primary screeners to all of the points of entry into the country, all of the land border crossings, international airports, ports, etc. Um, they sent out social mobilization teams to visit about 26,000 households in the neighborhoods where some of these contacted people uh, were living. Um, there uh, was an immediate request for help from the international uh, community. And so up to date, there have only been eight deaths uh, in Nigeria. Um, all of the contacts from that original case have now uh, completed a 21-day follow-up. There are no more confirmed cases. Um, now, given the fact that Lagos is the largest city in West Africa, and there are uh, flights to Lagos from all of the other capitals in the region, that I'm not suggesting that Nigeria is completely out of the woodwork. Um, but this type of response was uh, definitely effective in uh, preventing things from uh, accelerating on the scale that they have in other countries. Senegal has been even more successful. Um, there are no Ebola cases in Senegal today. There have not been any deaths. Um, the first case in Senegal that showed up was uh, from a student from Guinea who had crossed uh, the border. And again, that student and all of the contacts were identified and isolated. Um, the border was closed back in August, and the government basically um, dispatched uh, mobile phones to the village heads of, of uh, the communities, all of the border uh, communities, just to make sure that people weren't slipping across borders, which tend to be pretty porous uh, in uh, West Africa in general. Um, you can see the uh, Minister of Health uh, highlighted in the picture above. Um, the Senegalese government and the WHO um, have provided uh, quite a lot of money um, for a public health uh, informational uh, campaign. In Senegal, also, the relationship between uh, the government and religious leaders has always been very good. Um, and that often helps to uh, communicate awareness of diseases. Um, for this reason, the spread of HIV, for instance, in Senegal is also much, much lower than in many, many other uh, countries in Africa. I just wanted to highlight um, the extent to which uh, public health uh, infrastructure in throughout West Africa is completely inadequate and underfunded compared to uh, what it is in developed countries. So you can see um, on the chart up there the average for the OECD. So those are the countries that belong to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So all of the wealthy countries of the world, basically. Um, and you can see on average they have about 320 uh, doctors per uh, 100,000 people, um, which is more than 100 times the number of doctors uh, you have per capita in a country like uh, Sierra Leone, right? Over here, uh, this is uh, a log uh, ratio graph. So the scale on the left um, basically goes from 1, 10 to 100, 1,000, 10,000, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it tracks the number of cases and deaths uh, over time. And there are a couple of things I wanted to, to highlight here. One, in the black, that's the number of uh, cases and the number of deaths in the solid line. And you can see that the uh, increase uh, has been pretty dramatic, uh, particularly since the end of June here. Um, 
You can also see a lot of variation across countries. So the first cases were in uh, Guinea, and then later uh, Liberia, and then later Sierra Leone. If you look over time, uh, the number of cases, I'm sorry, uh, in Guinea, um, the pace of acceleration has slowed. Uh, whereas Liberia has continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, down here you can see uh, Nigeria where the, the total number of deaths um, was been eight, um, and that's Senegal in the United States uh, where there have not been any deaths uh, so far. Now, as horrifying as things have been over the past three months, I also do want to emphasize that over, as a percentage of the population, the death toll has still been very low. Um, more people will die on a daily basis from uh, malaria, uh, for instance, which has been around forever. So just to sort of keep that in mind. Um, so even in the worst affected country, uh, which is Liberia, uh, the death toll uh, has been uh, about one hundredth of one percent of the total population so far. Um, there's obviously still a lot of potential for things to get worse, um, given how rapidly the, the disease has been spreading in the past uh, few months. Um, just to uh, talk a little bit about why some countries have been more successful dealing with the spread of Ebola than others. Um, so the most successful countries in West Africa have been uh, Senegal and Nigeria. And part of the reason for the success um, has to do with the rapid responses of the governments initially. Part of the reason why this happened was that the first uh, cases in Senegal and Nigeria happened uh, to people coming in from other countries and people who were also at the high end of the socioeconomic uh, sort of uh, ladder. Nigeria in particular is a country that has an immense amount of socioeconomic inequalities, which means that in the large cities like Lagos, um, there are first-class hospitals, um, and in remote areas, there aren't. So if you're traveling into Nigeria on a plane as a foreign diplomat, and you're screened for uh, Liberia, you would get taken to a very um, well-maintained uh, hospital. You would be attended to by very highly qualified doctors, etc., etc. And um, as a result of this, the way in which the disease uh, was responded to was just very different from when it affects people uh, living in areas that look like West Point in, in Liberia, right? Um, Nigeria also is, it's a poor country, but it's considerably more wealthy um, than either Sierra Leone or Liberia. You can see some uh, statistics up here. The per capita income in Nigeria is about four times what it is in Liberia. Um, the number of doctors per capita is about 40 times in Nigeria what it is in Liberia. Interestingly, in Nigeria as a whole, there are actually fewer beds per capita as there are in Liberia, which is why I'm suggesting that if the disease were actually to spread rapidly in poor areas, um, the, the consequences of this could be quite catastrophic. Um, given that so far it's been contained to relatively uh, wealthy people in wealthy areas of the most developed cities, um, the uh, um, response has been much more effective so far. I mentioned this already, both uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia were um, badly uh, affected by civil wars back in the 1990s. Um, for all of its um, regional low-lying instability, religious conflict, Boko Haram, etc. There's been no large-scale civil war in Nigeria um, since the late 1960s. Senegal is one of the best governed, most politically stable countries in uh, West Africa. And I'll show a little bit of data uh, to highlight this. So 
Up here, what uh, compiled our uh, an indic this is an indicator of the uh, the World Bank issues every year, going back to 1996. Um, it, it measures uh, perceptions of government effectiveness. So, what is the quality of government policy? Um, how well do governments actually carry out their policies? And whether or not uh, governments are perceived as being credible by people living uh, in the country. And the countries that perform the best on this indicator, uh, places like Singapore, Canada, Norway, would score around a two. You can see the United States is very high, uh, certainly relative to any place in, in West Africa. But just look at the difference between Senegal, for instance, um, and Liberia. Right. What's ironic here, uh, and I mentioned this already, is that both Liberia and Senegal, sorry, both Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone, I'm sorry, are much better governed today than they were uh, 20 years ago. But a lot of what you're seeing, and we see today in terms of the, the, the inability of the state and the government to respond, um, I'm suggesting has to do with decades of neglect, mismanagement, uh, the consequences of civil wars, etc., that have seriously eroded uh, the capacity of the state and the quality of government uh, to deal with crises. Um, just looking ahead, what we need to do, stabilize Liberia, Sierra Leone, those are the most important priorities. Um, there are also important lessons, I think, that we can learn. Uh, um, from what was done right in both Nigeria and Senegal. And in a way, those are more uh, reasonable models for other countries in West Africa, because it's not, not like either Nigeria or Senegal have the resources or the state capacity that the United States or Britain or Canada may have, right? Um, but the simple things in terms of better public information campaigns and public health measures and being able to effectively screen, isolate, uh, treat people and contacts um, have so far prevented a catastrophe um, in Nigeria and Senegal. But it's really important, um, kind of as a lesson from this, to focus on building better state capacity, better government, um, building public trust in, in West Africa, um, particularly in the countries that have been most uh, affected in their recent pasts uh, by uh, civil war. So um, that's the end of my uh, presentation, and we'll, we'll be happy to take some questions. So thank you. Great, thank you guys. Um, I think what we'll do is just open it for questions. If you have any questions, raise your hands.